Hey guys, welcome back to Riding to Excellence. Uh, my name is Louisa, I'm your host again for today, and today we have Dr. Hewlett and Dr. Mundy in the podcast chair. This is Dr. Matt Mundy's first podcast, so I think he's a little nervous, but I think he's going to do okay. Yeah. Um, so hi guys, how are you today? Doing really well, thanks Louisa. Doing good today, thanks. Awesome. So yeah, I guess we're going to start off a little bit, we're going to do a bit of an intro, um, we're going to introduce you guys to our newest veterinarian, Matt, that's why he's in the podcast here today, and then we are going to talk about winter wellness, that was kind of the biggest topic that you guys had asked about when we put it out there on social media, there was a lot of other great topics that we're going to cover too, but since we're just kind of getting out of this polar vortex, we thought this would be a good one to start off with in February, since you guys are probably wanting to get back to showing and riding, I'm sure. So yeah, let's get to Matt. We are super excited that our newest veterinarian has joined our team. Matt was a little scared, like I said, but Chad and I dragged him in here anyways. We're going to focus uh, the bulk of this podcast on winter, so let's chat a bit with Dr. Mundy so that our customers listening can get to know him a little bit better. Um, some of you have probably already seen him out on some calls. He's been in the clinic for the last couple weeks, but for a lot of you, he might be in a new space. So, Matt, obviously I can hear a bit of an American accent there. Where'd you grow up and what is your background in? So, background, I was born in Ontario and grew up in, uh, mostly in Georgia, a little town in Florida, quite a few years in Mississippi for school. And then my background prior to veterinary school was a lot of farming. Yeah. Did a lot of cattle, a lot of hay. Cool. Kind of works with that accent. Yeah. <laughs> you sound like a, a rancher. <laughs> so, um... With your background, I guess it almost makes sense, but what made you choose to be a veterinarian? Oh, probably since I started on a graduate degree in college, I considered it. Mm -hmm. Didn't do it back when I first graduated. And farming got difficult with the cattle prices, uh, weather and hay wasn't going well, so I decided I needed to do something different. Mm -hmm. And then decided that I wanted to prove to myself that I could get through vet school. Yeah. So at you know, 36 years old, I decided to change my life and go back to school. Where'd you go to school? Mississippi State. Awesome. Was it a good school? Did you like it? I don't know if many of our listeners are familiar with Mississippi State, maybe. I, I think it was a fantastic school. Yeah. Awesome. A, lot of, a lot of hands on experience at that school. That's awesome. A lot more than most. Yeah, sets you up for success. Yeah. So um, now that you've been a veterinarian, uh, for the past couple years, you've been practicing for a while. You were out in Ontario before we kind of poached you out to Alberta. Mm -hmm. What are some of your favorite aspects of being a veterinarian? Uh, everything's different every day. It's very rare you see the same thing over and over again. It's challenging. It's like I've been doing it for five years and I'm like, I don't think I've gotten very far along with my career because there's so much to learn. Mm -hmm. And just, just the opportunity to learn more and get better yeah. is exciting. That's awesome. Um, so how are you feeling about your big move <laughs> and landing in Airdrie, the, uh, the beautiful crown of Canada? As Airdrie, some, Canada. Airdrie, Canada, Chad's <laughs> favorite place. <laughs> How are you liking it so far? It, it's getting a little better. It's, it's scary. I moved uh, yeah. twice as far away from home as where I was in Ontario. And yeah. Obviously, I didn't know anybody out here, so I've been here two weeks. And, uh, like it. Starting to get familiarity. And weather's not helping, but... <laughs> no, I know. Yeah, poor, poor Matt came out. We, well, you were traveling during the polar vortex, were you not? Yep, yep. Got, got actually snowed down in the Sprite or shut down one night, so... Oh, man. Early day. Yeah, you, but you didn't turn around. No, good sign. Didn't turn around. <laughs> well, when I came here, we'd had this weather in Ontario for two weeks, too. So. Oh, see, <laughs> well, we did it. So you're just really living it. Yeah. So I guess kind of to wrap up our little intro, you're doing great. What excites you about joining our team here at Energy Equine? Uh, the family atmosphere, the the team atmosphere. Everybody seems to be on the same page. Everybody seems to work together, and uh, just feel like there's going to be some good mentorship here. And hopefully, my skills will drastically improve over the next six months or year. Yeah, totally. Well, I know that. The clients that have already seen you so far have been very complimentary. They've really been enjoying you coming out to the to their farms and stuff. So it's been awesome to have you so far. That's good. <laughs> so like I said, I heard that you've been given a nickname <laughs> by some clients. Do you want to divulge or is that for a later podcast? You can go ahead and tell you if you want it. <laughs> we heard that Dustin got it. Is that correct, Chad? Dustin named Dustin, him Bubba? Dustin and Marla, yeah. 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 But they those two have spent a lot of time in the South, eh? so they're always... Um, they like all the southerners uh, as far as the cutting goes so that was the first thing that they thought after they met Matt like one day yeah <laughs> literally I was impressed that he's a keeper because you, you get a nickname on the first day it's a pretty good deal yesterday when we were there 
and I said to him, I said, I don't know, I don't know if he likes his nickname. And Dustin goes, well, it could get worse. So, yeah. <laughs> so I was like, I think he's gonna take Bubba. So. Yeah, sure, I like him. <laughs> Bubba, I think he's gonna get a little bit bigger, a little bit overweight. Yeah. yeah, people are probably listening to this being like, who is this guy on the other end of the podcast microphone? We promise that Matt is not huge and overweight. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess you guys, if you see Matt in the clinic, if you see him out on call, uh, make sure to tell him hi and introduce yourselves if you haven't met him yet, and uh, maybe repeat back some of these fun facts you learned about him. All right, so now that I have two veterinarians in the hot seat, let's get down to some actual serious podcasting business. Um, the polar vortex has for sure sucked. And it especially sucks when we're trying to get our horses legged up for show, show season. Or even if we just kind of want to take some time to ride and kind of regain our sanity. It's pretty hard to regain sanity even in indoor arenas that are freezing cold. So when we asked our followers what they wanted to hear about in the next, next podcast, Winter Wellness came up quite a few times. Um, so let's start off with something on all of our minds. We're going to have both Chad and Matt answer the questions today. So we'll start off with how cold is too cold to ride? You go first? Yeah, sure. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, so we talked about this earlier, um, and, and it's been on a, a lot of clients' minds is when, you know, what, how should I be doing things, or should I be out moving around with my horse? Uh, you know, I don't want to lose time to all my competitors. Um, you know, the neighbor down the road has an indoor arena, and I don't. So the question becomes is how cold is too cold to ride? I think if your horse is outdoors training, for me, you got to really start questioning when you get around that minus 15, minus 20. I know when we were at the racetrack, we didn't train a lot of times when it got below minus 15 for a solid day, minus 20 for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, minus 15 with a sunny day in a good situation, we'd still send horses out to train for yeah. what my concern would be. Racing for sure was not an option at those, those mm -hmm. temperatures. And the same thing with um, non farm athletics, like taking a heavy trip at that point. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So we did kind of leading into that track question. We had a specific question about running in the cold, I'm assuming from one of our barrel racers. Uh, and this can kind of play out for multiple disciplines. If you're not in a heated arena um, and you are maybe exercising outside, maybe you're trying to long trot outside, how cold is too cold to really run in or exert your horse? And you're kind of saying minus 15 is a golden rule. I think you I think you can go below that. I just think you got you, every time you do that, you take a little bit from your horse, right? Mm -hmm. And then you do run the risk of, of hurting them uh, from a standpoint of bleeds and different things. So time in and time out, minus horse seems yeah. to be the, the one thing I saw cool. was that minus 15, minus 20 range, it shows that you don't have enough time from the time you breathe in your, the time it hits your lungs for that air to warm up enough. Mm -hmm. And it shows that it does cause damage to the lungs going forward, you know, just to getting that cold, that cold air really hitting the lungs. So with those barrel racers in mind then, um, with that lung information, if you have a horse that's susceptible to bleeding, could it damage them even, even further? Is that a horse that you would really caution or not? I think, yeah, I think we got to be, those, especially horses that we know already have a respiratory issue, uh, the more, you know, as Matt mentioned, the more damage that you've caused to that lung, the more difficult it is for the allergies to, re, you know, to, to be taken care of. The body's recouping enough already, right? And if we put more inflammation, more damage on top of that, I think we run the risk of hurting those horses. Yeah, totally. So another great question came in asking how you can ensure your horse is happy and healthy before and after you ride in the cold. Um, keeping in mind some people might be in heated arenas, some people might be in non-heated arenas, and some people might be outside. What are some things that owners can or should be doing before and after a cold weather ride as a rule? My thoughts are warm the horse up more. Spend more time warming them up, also at the end, cooling them off quite a bit more. And as Chad and I talked about earlier, warming the horse up even in really, really cold weather, it's hard to get them warm enough to get those, those ligaments and joints and tendons and all warmed up to where you don't have a higher risk of damaging the horse. Um, so it's just a you know, key thing to work them warm and warm them up and cool them off. Mm -hmm. I fully agree. I, th I think that the, the from the standpoint of soft tissue, which is what we're pr trying to protect, in the bones too. I mean, your risk of, of fracturing the bone gets higher, you know, in the sense of the damage part there, and the, the lung part we were talking about before too. Those horses need to be able to get to where that air can be warmed up to body temperature or at least close to body temperature by the time they're trying to really get down into their lungs. Mm -hmm. you know, it just becomes more difficult. 
So then, I guess, like, I have this vivid memory of, like, trying to show a winter series pass, and my horse is soaking wet, and I've been cooling her down for 30 minutes, and she's still cold, but we have to hop her on the trailer to go home. So kind of, what's your advice there? What are the problems that can arise? Um, is it recommended that a horse be completely dry before being turned out or trailered home, or kind of what's your rule of thumb? I'd like to see a horse completely dry before you take him back out, you know, even before you put the blanket on. You know, when you put the blanket on a wet horse, he's going to just, you know, have a net dry off here as well. You know, imagine coming outside and being wet, you feel much colder than you do being dry. You know, same for the horse. Mm -hmm. yeah. And to add to that, I think some people put coolers on uh, inside and then try to suck that moisture out of them mm -hmm. a little bit. I think that's a, that's a good idea, but I, I'm fully on with Matt in some case you'll be 100% dry. You can add in with your clips too, you know, depending right. on who they are. I try to leave as much hair on my horses that are out as possible. Nice long hair from that coming, especially on their neck and head to make sure that that's fully protecting their legs mm -hmm. and other stuff. But you can do some belly clips on those or certain kinds of um, clips to help cool them up quicker if we don't have a good blanket on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a really good option there for those people that want to maybe do like a trace clip or a belly clip. They can still be turned outside, they'll still be warm enough, but it'll cool them down quicker. Um, so that leads us to trailering. I think a lot of people go outside and realize how cold it is, and then they, you know, they triple blanket their horses to compensate. They hop them in the trailer. I think we've all seen that photo of like the really tough Shetland without a blanket on, and the dressage horse with like six blankets, and the Shetland's like... Well, what's wrong with you? And the dressage horse is like, well, my mom was cold today, so I, I have to be bundled up. Yeah. I mean, the reality is that if a horse is overly blanketed in a poorly ventilated trailer, they can overheat, and the opposite effect of what we've been talking about can happen. So what do you guys recommend for people trailering in cold weather? Um, first off, I think a great tip I've heard is that to have an in-trailer thermometer so you can measure the actual temperature within your trailer, not use the outside temperature to judge with. So, because I think that's a big thing. If it's cold outside, it might not actually be cold in the trailer. So, what are some other um, tips that you guys have for cold weather trailering? Uh, I think that thermometer thing is brilliant. I'm excited about that. <laughs> well, there you go. You <laughs> learn something new every day on yeah, the podcast. Yeah, I learned something new on this podcast that I didn't. That I yeah, that's that's a really great idea. And, I think that's really worth doing. T a lot of times I'll talk to my clients about just checking, you know, once you get your horse in there and you got things set up and you use it to diesel trucks, so the truck's warming up or anything and the horse is loaded. I like to start with the trailer pretty boxed up to start with. But there's gotta be some ventilation in there. You do see them sometimes when people pull in and they unload the horse out of there, he's, he or she's been a little worked up and it's just like this steam bath rising out of there. I, I don't know if that's good either. I think that the horses need to be environment where they're not sweating inside there mm -hmm. um, and trying to figure that out can be tough but the, the thermometer inside the trailer is a brilliant idea and, and then feeling underneath of your horse uh, like what's the horse's body feel like in the trailer um, once they're in there and then checking those kinds of things I think is important obviously keeping the time to the lowest amount that you can stretch trailing I feel is, is optimum um, just because then you need to put all your cooling measures mm -hmm. Yeah, some other tips we kind of did ahead of time, definitely um, for these cold weather days, and even when it's starting to warm up but the roads are pretty icy, plan ahead. Um, I know it's kind of a redundant thing to say, but safety is important. Don't travel in poor road conditions if you don't have to. Um, it's so easy to slip out on these roads right now. Um, use those windows to allow air to escape. You make sure screens are up to stop any snow or moisture coming in, so that air is still circulating in your trailer, but it's, you're not creating an even more damp environment. And then, like they said, know your horse. If your horse is completely body clipped, they're going to require a heavier blanket or a slinky or, you know, a couple blankets than, you know, our fuzzy turned out friend who's coming in um, just for a checkup. If your trailer is loaded down with multiple horses, consider the body heat the whole group is emitting as well. I think that's another thing that people don't think about. If you've got one super fuzzy turned out horse and a body clipped horse, you still have two more horses in that trailer than you would. Um, I didn't realize Chad didn't know my little temperature thermometer trick. You can get just stick on thermometers at Canadian Tire, super cheap. Obviously make sure that they're kind of being effective, but it's not a, a huge expense to you. And then provide hay for those horses to munch on. And like they said, if those horses are very sweated up in the trailer, recognize that that's dehydration and that can occur in the winter too. 
stopping for water breaks on a long haul is always a good idea. Keeping cisterns of water in the back of your truck so that the water is warmer for those horses is a great tip as well. Okay guys, so how, what are some signs and symptoms to look for if your horse isn't doing well in the trailer in relation to what we've discussed? What should um, haulers be looking for if their horse isn't doing great? Go ahead with that. Okay. Uh, I feel like the, when we talked about before, feeling underneath that blanket, looking at how that horse comes off the trailer or how they're standing in the trailer is important. So just knowing the horse and understanding where their temperature's at, looking at them, you know, what's their, you know, normally in the trailer, do they have a normal nice winter or do they pee in the trailer? Those kinds of things, making sure that you're aware of their vitals um, in terms of kind of what they do. If, if the horse is normally eating in the trailer, like you said before, I think that's super important. You know, uh, you know, and preparing them for the trailer. So is there water available before they go on? Did they get their meal that they were supposed to get? Are they in a, you know, is there a routine in a good spot, right? Um, and you know, equipment wise, are we prepared with, do I need to have you know, two coolers, one cooler? As you said, those kind of things to know to gauge that and have the temperature fluctuate and how far can we travel? Right? Mm -hmm. Couple more. You'd like to see a horse have hay in front of them on the trailer at all times, right? Or, or something to eat. I think in the winter conditions, or even in the summertime, I, I, if the horse can have some sort of roughage in front of them, it just helps. We, you know, we know they're secreting acid all the time in their mm -hmm. belly, so it also is a signal to us that that's there. I think those are the things that are there if the horse is under stress um, and the hay is out. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, barring allergies, you know, and yeah. Yeah. all those kinds of good triggers. Yeah. So. Yeah, definitely. Some horses it's recommended that they don't have forage on the trailer, but for most, I think it's a pretty safe bet. And you know, you can put up a slow feed trailer and get a long way, or a slow feed hay bag and get a long way with you know, a couple plates of hay. So, what are, oh yeah, so another major concern that came up for our followers was water consumption. How can we ensure our horses are getting enough water, and how much water should we aim to give our horses during the winter? Yeah, sure. Uh, horses do drink quite a bit of water every day. 30 to 45 liters is, is standard. Uh, we would like to see them drinking it. I agree with Chad when we talked earlier. I don't like to see a horse having to drink really, really cold water. Get them on water heaters in the in the water tank. Keep the water a little warm. It'll help them drink a little bit more. Um, I find that horses that don't have warmer water or have to drink really cold water aren't going to drink as much. They can talk while they're pulled forward. Uh, that's that's a big thing to me is you know not not having We discuss also about um, salt consumption or mm -hmm. electrolyte mm -hmm. consumption. I think those are ways that you can encourage your horse to drink a little bit more. Um, I'm, I'm old school, being from Iowa, <laughs> I'm old school in the sense of, and, ra and on the racetrack, I love mashes. And we were talking about that before too. So if you're adding a lot of moisture to your mashes during the horse, you're gonna get more, more water in there. Is it gonna be 30 to 45 liters? No, it, but it's there. Um, and you know, same for warm soup or warm tea is going to just it just warms you up from the inside i think that you can do that with the water like matt said keeping it you know tepid or whatever um, helps those horses too they want to warm it up inside their belly mm -hmm. so for those that aren't old school what is a match there might be some people that have never heard that term before okay so i <laughs> you want to do this or you go ahead you want to do this mississippi yeah, yeah so the two okay. americans they got so, their mash yeah so for me you, you can take you can use anything to make as far as concentrates, um, you can use cubes. Uh, but probably the favorite one is, is something we call mixed with your concentrate. And what I like about that is two things. And you know, just like showing my bias again is horses hind gut digester. I love the fact that bee pulp is this digestible fiber these horses get. And I think it just fills them up. I think you can put quite a bit of warmth into it. You can put some water in it at the same time. Right? Mm -hmm. and do it so it's just a nice delivery system. Beet pulp isn't for every horse, you know, so some people are just really used to get oat mash, you know, and I know Dr. Duran talked in his lecture about the fact that soaking oats doesn't actually make them more bioavailable, but in this situation, I think you're just trying to make it more of a soup or a warm up or just entice them to eat. Mm -hmm. You can throw our salt in there, um, you can throw your core balance or your mineral product in there too to make it easier, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely at this point, we're not really 
uh, totally talking about you know the bioavailability, but it's really just a great trick to get them to drink more water and have a kind of tepid environment for them. Yeah. Um, so a couple other things that we talked about, you know, be sure to check water supplies that freeze and break them open if they are frozen. If that's kind of what you guys have to deal with out there, then just make sure that you're you know constantly checking them and breaking them open if possible. And if you are using submersible heaters, make sure to keep the water supply open and free of ice. Check to see if it is giving off stray voltage and shocking horses when they try to drink. Again, it seems like one of those things that, you know, a lot of you are probably like, well, I check them every day, but I've heard of so many instances of shocking, of fires in the winter. So it's just another safety precaution in the winter that unfortunately we have to deal with out here in Alberta and in Canada, I guess. Maybe in Mississippi. I don't know. Is it cold in Mississippi right now? No? Not like us. No, yeah, I'm like, I don't think you guys have submergible water heaters <laughs> like we do. <laughs> so, can excessively cold water bring on colic? Why is it that we can see colics in the wintertime? I, I don't think it's necessarily excessively cold water as much as when you have cold water, they don't drink as much. Mm -hmm. uh, the way the horse's guts work is that you don't have enough moisture throughout the guts. There's points in the guts where you get dry feet trying to pass through that's going to get stopped up. That horse is probably going to start to call it because they didn't pass much up at that point. And as Chad and I talked about our heaps of guests earlier, adding mineral, adding salt, adding something for balance or something to feed to stimulate them to drink more keeps the guts more moisturized, keeps food moving through it better, and, and can help prevent colic quite a bit in the winter. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think if a horse does drink too cold of water, usually we find that more in the summer. Like, I mean, in the wintertime, yes, they're gonna do it, but in the summertime, they actually have water available and they gorge themselves. I don't know if it's the temperature or too much, but you'll see them colic or you know, get upset from it. And mm -hmm. in the wintertime, it tends to be less water drank because they don't like the temperature. And so they stay slightly dehydrated. Yeah, totally. I think like all through this whole podcast, what's really sticking out is, you know, just be really aware of your horse your environment and kind of what you're bringing them into and just kind of be extra vigilant, I guess. Horse owners know that. They know They know that horses are always trying to die. <laughs> um, so let's end our discussion on winter nutrition. With the performance horse in mind, how much forage should uh, these horses be eating daily? I mean, we, again, this is uh, pretty standard for us. Is I think that performance horses, if anything, in the wintertime, if they're just a tiny bit not a bad thing, right? If they if they have an extra 50 or 70 or even 100 pounds for the winter and they're fit, like if they're unfit, then it's not healthy. But if they're fit, having that extra bit of fat, who can take that off in the spring? I, I'd rather they have lots of feed in front of them. I do think we have to take into consideration how much alfalfa is in there. If it's getting too strong on the alfalfa side, we're going to need an animal or get a horse on pure alfalfa all day long. But he or she, it'd be nice if they had some fiber in there to keep that system cranked up. Allows that they want to move around a little bit more. I think the more the blood flows, the better it is. Concentrate wise, I do think you can bump up on these days. You know, um, you can bump up as much as 20%. I know that you don't want to do that right off the hop, uh, but I do think that adding a little bit of extra into those horses just gives them some recovery because they're using a lot of calories right now just to stay warm and stay outside. A lot of calories. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you want to try and stay away from that. You know, think about them not being an energy deficit. In agreement, Scott. Yes. <laughs> um, so I mean, that kind of goes to what this next question is. But why do we see some horses lose weight in the winter, especially our senior horses? Well, like Chad said, they're burning a lot more calories trying to maintain heat. So if you're feeding them the same amount in the winter that you were in the summer, they're, they're not going to put on the weight that you put. And then in the older horses, you do find that their guts don't work as well. They don't digest as well. They don't absorb the nutrients as well. So they, they just don't do as well in the winter. Mm -hmm. uh, they need a lot more nutrients to keep up. So I guess we kind of touched on, you know, the beet pulp, the fiber, the minerals, and the salt. What are some things that we should be supplementing our horses with in the winter, you know, thinking about the cold specifically? I feel like, you know, it's, it's all about recovery. I mean, what's going to get us all, like, you know, what's going to kill us all is inflammation in some form, right? Whether it's cancer or breakdown of your body or just your heart wears out, whatever it is, that's all an inflammatory process where your mitochondria just don't recover at some point, right, at some stage. We can, we can label it however you want. So 
making sure each day that those metabolic needs are met and maybe even a little exceeded when it's cold out. So we're looking at making sure that there's the, there are the waters available that the horse is staying as hydrated as possible. And supplementation wise, you know, I love the mashes from two standpoints. Uh, besides food, one was the water content, the other was the heat that they get. So they're not using the killer powders of food that they eat to make heat. They're actually radiant, in a sense, like radiant heat, so to speak, when it gets inside of them. I think making sure that your vitamin and mineral supplementation is together, and I know it's just a pitch to core balance, but at the same time, you, you are going to be sometimes you question what you're going to be feeding high powered vitamins or minerals in the wintertime. Well, if I'm exercising my horse and I'm doing things, it's probably harder on them here in the winter than it is in the summer, other than they're in the trailer and having some sort of kind of balance that out. Mm -hmm. So I guess kind of to wrap up the winter wellness section, things to keep in mind, um, warm up and cool downs are always, you know, we should always be focusing on our warm ups and cool downs by at least 30 minutes, if not longer, especially if you're in an environment that's heated and you have to turn your horse out or go in the trailer, you know, like they said, we really want to make sure that our horses are completely dry before putting blankets on and putting them into those situations. Um, and then just really being vigilant, watching water intake and um, supplementing with the proper Proper supplements, um, you know, Chad pitched core balance, but it has it, it, it has its pre and probiotics, its electrolytes, you know, it's all there so that you're not, you know, kind of adding all these different things in for the winter. You're just keeping your horse on a really solid diet year round. Okay, I think that probably answers all our winter wellness questions, um, you know, but if you guys have any more questions, feel free to comment um, on Facebook or send us a message or on Instagram and, you know, ask us for any more questions we have. To wrap it up, I guess we can talk a little bit about the lecture that we just had on Saturday, the yeah. 16th. We had Rock. our first sports therapy lecture, um, the physiology of bidding. You know, Chad, how do you how do you think it went? We had Dave Elliott, we had you and Dr. Cox speak, and then we had uh, Bridget Meyer, Vitality Equine out. So I thought it was a pretty awesome day. Yeah, I was impressed with how many people were willing to brave the, I don't know, 60 kilometer per hour winds, minus 30. Um, I felt tossed a bit by the time I had this stairs cleaned off in the front, even though I was going at it as hard as I could and I had gloves on. So I was really impressed with how many people came out once we got things, you know, we had a little cool in the alleyway to start with because we were afraid it was going to get too hot. Uh, but all in all, a really good day. And I, I want to give a big shout out to Dave. Um, brilliant job. Like a, just a really knowledgeable, you know, just on his game. Uh, I felt like he really wanted to deliver to people. He brought lots of information some of it was even maybe too much to digest, I don't know, not even too much, but just a lot to digest, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and when you get into people that are really into their field, that's that's how it goes. You, know, so you spend a lot of years, you, you try to get a lot of passion. And I felt like Dr. Cox did a really good job of getting Dave around. You could see her passion for this horse medicine, for the ultrasound, figuring horses out and looking at them from a new paradigm of, you know, axial skull in first and then lower leg in second. And, and Bridget really tapped in and said what he did earlier, I, was, I felt a little bad for Bridget because we, we had a long day. People were trying to figure out their horses. Some of the people had driven a long ways and so we had one talk at the end on muscle physiology and she really put it together nicely. It was just, it was uh, at the end of the day it's hard in the sense of, like, she did a brilliant job though. I was really happy with how she put it together. Uh, lots of great questions. Uh, a lot of new, new, newer people to the, to the lecture this time. So I apologize for the fact that we didn't we're very uh, larger uh, and we won't be for the next one so if you're interested please sign up we'd love to have everybody come uh, we are working on other venues and making sure these are mentioned as well so we'll try to do as it grows right mm -hmm. so Matt it was your first ever lecture here at Energy Point yeah. I know you sat in on it what did you think what were your takeaways from the day I thought it was really good it's, it's nice to be working for a clinic that goes that extra mile and, and tries to inform the clients of different things like that not growing up with sport horses, not growing up showing horses, and not very familiar with the bit, so it was really an informative lecture for me, as well as hearing a lot of things that I had heard before but hadn't used in a while, so hearing a lot of things that have been taught before, it was nice to, nice to be involved in that. Plus, I got to meet a few clients. Yeah, it's always good, right? Put some names to faces. Yeah, I think Dave, you know, he's such a wealth of knowledge 
he was such a draw for our first clinic, which was exciting for us, and I'm sure the public as well. But he really, you know, as a bit maker, he really drove home the point that if you're bumping up or down bits, are you looking at the physiology of your horse? Like, you know, it, it, he even made a point like, well, if your horse isn't, if you're having, a, like, I'm gonna go back to cutting because that's what I know, but if you're having a hard time steering your horse in the herd, are you actually having a hard time steering your horse in the herd or are you having a hard time steering them right? And if it's steering them right, that might just be, you know, a sports medicine problem that might not be a bit problem. So I thought that was really cool. He like, he just has so much knowledge. You know, he told me he could do three days straight, no PowerPoint, just talking. And I was like, oh my God, I don't know if I could do that with you, Dave, but I'm sure you can. Could start with a hundred and finish with 10. Yeah, exactly. He, I think he likes, he said that he didn't even tap into his knowledge and he likes some pretty intense days. Um, he did say that he's interested in coming on the podcast, so we're gonna get that together hopefully in the next couple months uh, between our two schedules. I think that'll be really cool to have Dave on the podcast, and I think it's cool that he's willing to, to be on one. Yeah. Um, so coming up, our second one was just announced, March 23rd, Ulcers is an equine athlete. I think a lot of our clients are very familiar with ulceration in their horses, and they kind of want to see the broad spectrum of it. We have uh, Dr. Jean Yin Tan from UCBM, the University of Calgary, coming to talk about um, ulcers from the internal perspective. Uh, she is a specialist, so that'll be exciting. We have Dr. Doug Myers um, from Bow Ringer Ingelheim coming to talk about Canadian research um, in ulcers, kind of early research. Most research that's been done in the past has been on American horse populations, so it'll be exciting to hear some Canadian perspective. Um, and then in the afternoon, we have Tina Watkins from Enhanced Therapy. Tina is an amazing, amazing massage therapist. Um, she herself teaches massage therapy. You know, she has many, many numbers and things after her name as well that I can't remember right now, so sorry, Tina. Um, but she's going to talk about the big picture, how ulcers affect the performance horse, um, what riders can see in their horses that would maybe tell them that the horse is dealing with some ulcer problems. I love when Tina messaged me about her talk. She said, you know, so often we don't listen to what our horses are trying to tell us. So her whole talk is kind of going to be about that. You know, are we really listening? And then to finish off the day, it's going to be a big day at the clinic. We're going to do a live scoping demonstration. Um, so one of our vets will be scoping in the stock, and that'll be fed onto a screen where another vet will be talking through the process of what's happening and what that scope is seeing. Um, Bowringer Ingelheim has come forward and sponsored the event today, so they're bringing it. Um, they're making it possible for us to host the event, and we're super thankful for Clayton, Doug, and the whole team over there for. For, for sponsoring it, so I think it's going to be exciting. All right, gentlemen, anything else to wrap up the podcast today? <laughs> it was nice to meet everybody, and I look forward to meeting everybody in person. Not so bad as first. <laughs> I know. It wasn't that bad. Was it yeah, bad? No, it wasn't bad. It wasn't bad. I'll, I'll do it again if I need to. <laughs> just saying, Dr. Toth, if you're listening, haven't even gotten you on the podcast yet. Yeah. Matt just beat you. Train's coming up. Zero one, yeah. Uh, Actually, I should mention that Dr. Toth and one of our great techs, Megan Orange, they're currently in Tennessee yeah. um, doing a rehabilitation certificate program. We're super excited for them to come back. Um, I think they were, you know, we, we believe that they're brilliant, but they were like, this course is going to be intense, but I think they're going to come back with a wealth of knowledge. And when, once they get home and they, you know, get all their clients seen, we're going to have them on the podcast to talk about Tennessee and what they learned when it comes yeah. to rehabilitation. Yeah, that should be number one for her. Her yeah, that can be her first one. Yeah. She'll she'll love talking about that. She'll get all geeked out and excited. Cool. All right, guys. Um, as always, let us know what you'd like to hear from us. We love the feedback we had on the last post about the podcast. We love that you guys are listening. We think it's just so awesome. Um, send us a message if you have any ideas. Make sure to comment and let us know how we're doing on Facebook or Instagram. And we'll see you next time. Thank you.